Well, today I was asked to talk a little bit about the history and management of bighorn sheep in Utah. It's been a real love and a passion of mine for a long time. I went to work for the division in 1978 and uh, moved some sheep, was involved in a transplant those first couple of years, and it was pretty exciting to me. And from then on, I took every opportunity I could to be involved in the sheep program and, uh, and have been for the last 35 years. And there's just something about bighorn sheep that are magical. They live in beautiful places and they're neat animals and they're and uh, there's just something about them that are special. Um, this, this first picture, I've got to tell you something about it. I have to make a confession. Uh, I love watching sheep. And I saw that sheep, and I took this picture of him, and I told the biologist I was with, I'm going to draw a tag next year, and I'm going to kill that sheep. Okay. And lo and behold, I drew a tag. And he said, now let's see you find that sheep again. <laughs> And so after 10 days, I finally found him <laughs> the next year. He's hanging on my wall. <laughs> and uh, I've also been privileged to take a doll sheep. And I'm, if Greg would hurry up and get my name drawn, I'd have a Rocky. And then I've just got a stone sheep left. But uh, bighorn sheep are native to Utah and they're very common in rock art all over the state. And in some areas, it's probably the predominant thing depicted in rock art in Utah. And there's some really interesting things as you, as you look around uh, at the rock art in the state. You can see in some of these photos, there's obviously members of the dog family. Now, whether those are coyotes or wolves or whether they use dogs to hunt sheep, I don't, I don't know. But uh, Bighorn sheep petroglyphs are everywhere in Utah, and so they were, were very common. Uh, this is a real famous petroglyph out in Nine Mile Canyon. Um, bighorn sheep were hunted and, uh, and utilized by humans for many centuries before white men um, showed up. Now, can you tell which person in this is the sheep biologist? It could be this guy, and he's definitely a male. <laughs> but I'm thinking it's this guy. He not only has horns on his head, but somebody's tied his hands behind his back so he can't do his job. <laughs> but it, it shows you how, and you notice these sheep are all linked together, and I think that's pretty interesting. And it, uh, lots of lambs in it. You don't see a lot of lambs in petroglyphs, but that's pretty cool. Um, one of the first explorers to Utah was Father Escalante, who came here uh, the year of the Revolutionary War, 1776, and he made this statement in his journal as he traveled through southern Utah. He said, through here, wild sheep live in such abundance that their tracks are like those of great herds of domestic sheep. And so sheep were certainly abundant at that time. Um, the Spanish were in Utah from the 1500s on. They actually... Um, traveled the Spanish Trail that came up through Utah clear back in the late 1500s. Uh, one of the first white men that came to Utah was a trapper named Osborne Russell. In 1840, he had this observation. After climbing about half a mile, I sat down on a rock to wait for daylight, and when it came, I discovered a band of about 100 rams within 80 yards of me, and I shot and killed one. And that occurred just straight across the lake here back on the Wasatch Front, just north of Salt Lake on the, the Bountiful Bench. And so there were lots of bighorn sheep in that area. And I think when you have your discussion about the island here, there's archaeological evidence of, of bighorns on the island here too. Uh, another one of the early explorers was uh, John C. Fremont. Uh, he made this statement in 1846, but I think this referred to his... Uh, his uh, exploratory venture through the Great Basin in 1845. And he talked about the Great Basin, which is uh, mostly Utah and Nevada and southern Idaho. Uh, Instead of a barren country, the mountains were covered with grasses of the best quality, <coughs> wooded with several variety of trees, and containing more deer and mountain sheep than we had seen in any previous part of our voyage. And during this trip, they came from, they were exploring the Arkansas River in Colorado and then made a, a, a trip straight through Utah to Colorado. 
and they took time on that trip to come and explore the island here. And one of the people on that trip was Kit Carson. And uh, he made this statement about that 1845 trip. He said, Fremont took a few men, I being one, and we went to the island to explore it. We found good grass, water, timber, and plenty of game. We remained there some two days, killing meat and exploring the island. And that was this island. And so he was here long before the Mormon pioneers came, a couple of years. The Mormon pioneers came here in 1847. Well, uh, large numbers of people came here in 1847. In fact, it was only a few years before there were already 20,000 people living in Utah, largely Mormon pioneers. And bighorn sheep disappeared quite rapidly from Utah at that time. And there were a variety of reasons for it over the next um, few um, decades. Um, bringing domestic sheep to the area obviously introduced disease problems for the sheep and was probably the biggest impact. Um, encroachment by pinion juniper and other shrubs uh, changed the habitat from favoring bighorn sheep and elk to more of the browse species like deer. Um, uranium mining, which in the 1940s and 50s came into southern Utah in a huge way. They built roads and mines and left their junk all over southern Utah. And then human encroachment, especially in our desert areas, this is Moab, Utah, they all had an impact on bighorn sheep. And by the 1960s, we didn't know if there were any bighorn sheep left in Utah or not. And uh, they did find in the late 60s some desert bighorns along the lower Colorado River uh, in San Juan County in southeastern Utah. And uh, the Division of Fish and Game at the time decided to investigate that and they found that we had a, a small but thriving population of bighorns. There were no Rocky Mountain bighorns left and, uh, and um, so that was all that was left by the 1960s. Well, beginning in the uh, 70s and more aggressively in the 80s, Utah has been involved in an aggressive program to restore bighorn sheep for more than 30 years. And this was a massive effort. And I, I've got to appreciate the previous administrations that had patience with all of those that wanted to work with sheep. It was expensive and it was time consuming. And we, we spent a lot of time working at this and we moved a tremendous number of bighorns I wish I could give you the exact number, but I know I personally was involved in the movement of over a thousand bighorns. So we moved a lot of, of bighorns around the state. Fortunately, we had a lot of good, vacant bighorn sheep habitat that didn't have domestic sheep conflicts, and we were able to move a lot of sheep into those areas. And I've got to tell you, it could not have been done without organizations like FNAWS, uh, the Wild Sheep Foundation now. Um, we were in desperate need of money. When I, when I first came on with the division, we received a, a notification from the uh, department head at that time that we couldn't spend any more money on any species than that species took in. Well, bighorn sheep weren't taking in hardly any money. You know, a few tags at 50 bucks a piece or whatever they were. And so we didn't have any money. But the conservation permit program that allocated permits to FNAWS and were able to be sell, sold on auction brought a flood of money into the sheep program. And so we suddenly had lots of money to do lots of good things. And we spent a lot of it on transplants. And, and with that, we planted those seeds all over the state. None of us expected them to do as well as they did. We had herds where we just put 20 sheep that 10 years later we were hunting. They, they exploded in some of these areas because it was good habitat. And so I just want to say how thankful I am to, to FNAJ and the Sheep Foundation and, and other sportsmen's groups like SFW that took a big interest in sheep and helped us with the funding we needed uh, to do all this work. Um, I'm sure you know uh, bighorn sheep populations require intensive management. You can't let them get too abundant. You, you need to keep them thinned out. Uh, you need to, to take them to new areas. They're slow to pioneer new areas. And they require habitat work and predator control and all kinds of things to make them work. 
And so it, it really is intensive and it's time consuming, and, uh, but the rewards are great. Um, I went to the Utah Fanaz banquet uh, about every year, but I, I think it was two years ago when I went there and we had about uh, 40 or so of the hunters stand up that had hunted Utah that year with their rams. And, and I just felt like it was worth it. All of that hanging out of the helicopter and freezing cold weather and everything we put up with, look at these guys with their smiles on their faces that got to hunt bighorn sheep. And I was one of them. I never thought I'd hunt bighorn sheep in Utah, and I got to hunt. Um, so there was, there's some important tools that I want to talk about for managing bighorns. And, uh, that you can't just passively manage bighorns. They need intensive, active management or you're not going to keep them long term. It's, it takes a big investment to not only get them but to keep them. And so I want to just talk about each of those a little bit. Transplant projects were one of the tools we emphasized initially a lot. We had good sources of, of brood stock and, and we we had uh, the ability and the technology to move pretty big numbers of sheep to new areas and, and that helped them get started in new areas. And more importantly, it helped us thin out some herds that were getting quite large and prevent big die-offs in those herds. We, we felt like by keeping those populations down and thinning them periodically, it helped them from getting overpopulated and uh, dying out. Um, hunting, I can't, I mentioned this a little bit, but how important hunting is to, not only as a management tool, but in providing revenue for sheep management. And so hunting has been an important part of our, our management program from the beginning. And uh, our sheep in non-park areas have actually done better than sheep in park areas where they've been totally protected. Um, the biological basis is their surplus rams in every population and hunting removes the surplus rams, helps keep sex ratios balanced and help, helps keep herds healthy. And then, as I mentioned before, bighorn sheep can produce badly needed revenue for the restoration and management programs. Uh, we've had many hunters over the years that have bought tags through FNAWS and I, I know for some people, that really bothers them that that was a few less tags in the drawing. But I can tell you, we would not have 5,000 sheep in Utah and 75 people hunting bighorns every year without the 10 or 15 tags that, that go to Fanaz every year. So it's, it, it, helped prov it provides badly needed revenue that we could not have done this. And, uh, um, and we did a lot of work on a shoestring for a lot of years. Uh, we saved survey money so we could do transplants and we cheated our dear money a little so we could spend it on sheep and we, we did, we, never mind. We, <laughs> I can say that, I guess I can say that now, I'm retired. Uh, but habitat projects have been critically important to success here. Um, we had to create a buffer with our sheep populations and in some areas we had domestic sheep that were within striking distance of, of bighorn sheep and so one thing we used as a management tool um, with and mostly through Fanaz who negotiated these agreements was to go in and meet with cattlemen or sheepmen and say we'd like you to convert to cattle and, uh, and they we spent a ton of money doing this, and it raised a lot of eyebrows. You know, why would you spend that much money? But look at the results. We opened up all of these areas, and we're able to keep our bighorn populations from disease issues. And so that's been an important tool for us. Um, habitat manipulation. Um, Mother Nature's helping us quite a bit with this in recent years. Fire is becoming very common. Utah will now burn close to half a million acres a year, and it's pushing it into sheep habitat. And every, every time I see one of these fires, I call up Ryan and I say, where are you, Ryan? Are you, got, you got your matches out again? No. 
but it, it is a very important tool that creates good habitat for bighorns and uh, it, it removes the brush and opens up the landscape and can be replaced with grass. This is a burn out in the book cliffs that came back just beautiful. But it is a very good management tool that's helped uh, make our program successful. So uh, I can't underestimate the importance of that. You know, I, I had Valerius Geis down to Utah several years ago, and you all know who he is. And we had him here on the Wasatch Front where we were putting sheep on Provo Peak and Timpanogos. And I, I wanted his opinion of whether that was really good bighorn habitat or not. And he says, of course you see how the, the Native Americans burned this landscape on a regular basis um, so that to, to draw the sheep closer to them along the Wasatch Front here. And I'd never really looked at it that way. And he showed, uh, he, could, he could point out evidence of old burns and, and it was an important management tool for Native Americans and modern Americans uh, to, to enhance habitat for bighorn sheep, and it can be very valuable. Now, Mother Nature is doing a lot of that now without us having to start the fire, and uh, we just have to be ready with the seed. And Utah has invested over um, $70 million in habitat in the last eight years, and most of it has been focused on mule deer habitat, but a lot of it went into bighorn habitat to make it better and enhance it for bighorn sheep. Uh, guzzlers, water developments are a, a, uh, a, an important component of some habitats. They can enhance the area for bighorns and distribute them better, and uh, we've done quite a lot of work around the state with that and FNAS has been very helpful in monitoring and maintaining a lot of those guzzlers. Um, research has been an important part of our management program. Um, I can't underestimate the importance of that. We've done a ton of work with collaring literally hundreds of bighorns and learning all we can about their movements and their biology and uh, that's been very valuable to what we do. And there are several large-scale research projects in process right now. Um, I wanted to mention predator control. Um, <clears throat> the main predator that can cause you grief with, with uh, bighorn sheep is lions. And Vern, if he hasn't written a book on this, he could. <laughs> Have you written a book on this, Vern? No. <laughs> but they, it doesn't take a lion very long to learn how to kill bighorn sheep and they can be very good at it and they can be very efficient and they can take healthy populations and and uh, have a big impact on them in a short amount of time and so especially when you're trying to get a population started predator control is very important and before we do a transplant we do some preemptive predator control and try and remove as many lions as we can and then the few, first few years while that herd is becoming established, we continue with predator management. And then some herds are kind of in a chronic predator management situation where we're real liberal with, mount, with mountain lion harvest. And that's been very important. In areas where we haven't been able to get at the lions with sport hunting, we've had some trouble with sheep. Uh, some of the country down around Lake Powell, the Escalante unit, lion hunters can't get in there. It's just too remote, and there's some lions in there now really, really working those sheep over. And uh, the thought is that over time, if your herds are healthy and productive, they can withstand that predation, but especially in the early stages, they, they need a lot of um, attention in regards to predator control. So I just made a list of what the management challenges are for the future for bighorn sheep. Of course, disease is at the very top of that list, and you can lose a lot of sheep in a hurry. I'm really concerned about the thousand Rocky Mountain bighorns we have on the Lower Green River corridor now that are very close to some domestic sheep. And uh, <coughs> those issues just have to be resolved or you're going to lose your sheep. But habitat changes. Habitat is changing dramatically in Utah. And actually, in the case of bighorn sheep, it's mostly changing for the better. Uh, with the fire regime we're in, it's going back to bighorn habitat, but unfortunate for mule deer. 
And I think that trend's going to continue. We're going to see sheep continue to do well, and elk that are grass eaters and, and deer are, are going to struggle. Um, recreation, the amount of recreation in this state has is, is gotten crazy, and there, a lot of our remote areas are being um, easily accessed now, and that does have an impact on sheep, especially during lambing periods if they're heavily disturbed by uh, four-wheelers and mountain bikers. And uh, If you went down to Moab this weekend, it's just a ridiculous number of people down there during lambing. Um, predators is something that you need to be aware of, like we talked about. Urbanization, Utah is one of the fastest growing states in the nation and people are encroaching in bighorn habitat all the time and, and that's a, a huge challenge. And then, I, and then the last one I listed up there is wilderness. Um, wilderness is, can be good and it can be bad. Uh, sheep are definitely a wilderness species and they love wilderness and they love remote areas and they do well in remote areas. But when wilderness management prevents wildlife managers from doing their jobs, then it becomes a problem for bighorn sheep. And so we, when wilderness is proposed in Utah, we're not necessarily in favor of it. Uh, if it means stuff like you can never go in there and transplant sheep, you can never go in and maintain a guzzler, you can never do a seeding, you can never do any of that, then I don't think wilderness is good for sheep. So you have to handle those case by case. And, uh, and, and it's true you need remote and roadless areas for sheep, but you don't need no management. You need intensive management. And wilderness designation doesn't allow for that. And it's been a frustration for wildlife managers over the years. So I just want to conclude, I'm, I'm going to let you read that statement and then I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Uh, this is from the book Mountain Sheep of North America and I, I just think it, it sums up where we're at with bighorn sheep tremendously. So I've, I've carried that with me for a long time and I've, I've made it part of my ethical obligation, moral and ethical obligation, and this is actually in our statewide sheep management plan and I just think it's a great statement. And it sums it up. They are a, they're a, a uh, they face a precarious future and despite the rugged country they live in, they are an ecologically fragile species. And if we don't pay attention to them, they'll go away. And so uh, the years I have, the productive years I have left in this life, I want to do whatever I can to help protect big horde sheep and conserve them and make sure they're here for future generations because they are tremendous. Um, like I mentioned early on, I had the opportunity to hunt bighorn sheep, but even better than that, my son drew a tag and I was able to go with him and take a desert sheep. And uh, I got to tell you, that experience is worth more than you can ever imagine. And uh, providing that opportunity for people in Utah and just for people that, that don't hunt to see sheep. We have wild sheep viewing days in several areas of the state and people are just awestruck when they see their first bighorn at, or when they see bighorns butt heads. They are just absolutely awestruck. And we've got to, we've got to preserve them. We've got to keep them around for future generations. Thanks.